Good morning. Today is Wednesday, um, May 6th, and it is time to do my monthly wrap-up of reading in April. Um, the sun is doing weird and wacky things. It's playing hide-and-seek with the clouds, so I apologize if my lighting keeps changing. Maybe I should put down the shade. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, April. Um, it wasn't the most fantastic reading month, but you know what? Any month of reading is a good month of reading. <laughs> I just really had a lot of trouble, um, reading books this month. You'll kind of see. I think it's because I chose books that aren't really, like, my favorite kind of books. Um, doesn't mean that I didn't race through them, but they just weren't books that I'd say, oh, that's five stars. I'm definitely not five star Susan this month. And I didn't read as much as I normally do. So for the month of April, I read eight books. And um, the first one I read, we'll just jump right in, <laughs> was Jocelyn Jackson's Never Have I Ever. It's a 3.78 on Goodreads. And here is the description of the book. Amy is proud of her ordinary life and the simple pleasures that come with it, but her sweet, uncomplicated life begins to unravel when the mysterious and alluring Angelica Rue arrives on her doorstep one book club night. Never have I ever explores what happens when the transgressions of your past come back with a vengeance. That's from the publisher's description. Um, this came out in July 2019. I struggled with what to rate it. At first, I gave it a 2.5. And then I, I thought, I read this in one night. So I gave it a three. I mean, again, if if it's a book I that kept my attention for an entire, you know, however many pages, let's say it's probably roughly like 300 pages. Um, yeah, so I gave it a three. There's gonna be a lot of threes this month. Um, I guess, None of the characters are all that likable, and um, it does. There's no like, you know, soulful connection with this book, and that's okay. But obviously, the story was good enough to keep compelling me forward. Um, there's a really gross twist at the end too, and that that kind of put me off. And I don't know. But then I started watching. Uh, I watched some interview clips with the author and. Uh, she was fun to watch. Uh, the author is Jocelyn Jackson. Um, by the way, I read this on uh, Free from the Library via their electronic book system. Um, some of the things I thought of, from the interviews I read with her that were fun, she says, villains are always fun to write. And she has a villain in this book, someone who is extremely unlikable. <laughs> um, as for her own reading taste, she said she never gets tired of reading Flannery O'Connor, and when she needs comfort, she goes to Jane Austen. So she got points with me on both of those. Um, in this book, the main character is a scuba diving instructor, and so she and her husband learned how to scuba dive just for this book. At first, she was just going to research it, but then she decided she really, because some of the main scenes are underwater. So she decided she really needs to understand scuba diving. And now apparently they're both obsessed with it and scuba dive anytime they get a chance. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and I guess the question was posed to her, what made you become, want to become a writer? And she said, um, what made her want to become a writer was reading, more specifically being read to. Her dad was in the military, so they moved a lot. Her mom was the kind to find the library in each new town before even finding the grocery store. So, um, yeah, I, I do. I like to read. Um, tell me in the comments, do you like to, after you've read a book or maybe before, uh, do you like to research the author? I really do. It, it always opens up my perspective. And if I've been a little grumpy about a book, it almost always... I don't know. I guess you feel more of a kinship when, when you get to know someone better. And so, yeah, so I'm kind of a sucker for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, let me know in the comments if you guys do that too. Okay, the second book I read this month was Kevin Wilson's Nothing to See Here. 
So again, saw this all over social media months ago. Let's see, this came out, yeah, it came out near the end of 2019, October 2019. It's a 3.95 rating on Goodreads. I gave it 3.5 stars. Um, here, I'll, this is the description from the publisher. Lillian and Madison were unlikely roommates and yet inseparable friends at their elite boarding school. But then Lillian had to leave school unexpectedly in the wake of a scandal, and they've barely spoken since. Until now, when Lillian gets a letter from Madison pleading for her help. Madison's two, two stepkids are moving in with her family, and she wants Lillian to be their caretaker. However, there's a catch. The twins spontaneously combust when they get to agitated, Flames um, igniting from their skin in a startling but beautiful way. I guess <laughs> I love the novelty of that whole concept and um, it really drew me in. This is the first Kevin Wilson book I've read. Have you guys read this one yet? Nothing to see here. You probably have if you keep up with all the contemporary fiction. Um, this is his third novel, and what I found really interesting is he wrote it in 10 days, but he already had the plot in his head before he started writing. Um, let's see. He said, I spend a lot of time in my head before I ever write. This book was alive in my head and I knew what I wanted it to be. That was in a New York Times review. And then I found an interview with him, an NPR interview. He said, I was an anxious kid and I had all this agitation inside of me. And so it made sense that I assumed I might burst into flames. So I guess through the years, that concept has always like, you know, kind of obsessed him. And then he writes this book. It was a two day read for me. Um, I just felt it was very original. And again, most of the characters, other than the two adorable kids who catch on fire, they're not the most likable characters, neither Lillian or Madison, uh, the two main female characters, or Madison's um, politician husband are all that likable, or or Lillian's mom, but um, there's just some kind of magic about this book, and again, I gave it 3.5, and it is almost four stars on Goodreads, 3.95. Okay, the next book I read, I actually... I read this because if my mom were still with us, I know she would have loved this book. So I kind of read it with her in mind. It's called Eight Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson. Um, she loved mysteries. I, I enjoy mysteries from time to time. I'm just not obsessed with them. She was obsessed with them. <laughs> like She was um, having surgery once and I said, do you want me to go get you some books from the library? And she said, well, okay, but don't get any from, you know, the mystery section because I've read them all. And she was being serious. <laughs> so um, this Eight Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson, it's kind of an homage to the genre. And, um, but I should say this while I'm thinking about it. Um, when I, after I read it, I went on Goodreads and started reading what others wrote. And a lot of people had concerns because it's, it spoils classic mystery novels if you haven't already read them. The way I look at it is the books he talks about um, in Eight Perfect Murder, so he's listing eight actual books of fiction that have come, you know, our way through time. I mean, the oldest one was from 1922, and then the most recent one was The Secret History by Donna Tart in 1992. I mean, and the others are like the ABC murders, uh, double indemnity, strangers on a train. I feel like if you're into mysteries, you've probably already read the classics. So if you really don't, if you really intend to still read the those, you know, those classic mysteries, then maybe don't read this yet. Um, read those first because apparently it spoils the the endings. But um, uh. The Let me read you what the book description is. Um, a chilling tale of psychological suspense and an homage to the thriller genre tailor-made for fans. The story of a bookseller who finds himself at the center of an FBI investigation because a very clever killer has started using his list of fiction's most ingenious murders. Um, I gave this three stars. Uh, again, I was really torn because... 
I thought it was cool, the, the, the whole concept of this book, but I, the main character in this book is not my kind of main character, and that kind of was a turnoff to me a bit. But I read this, let's see, I read this, I think, in, it was a three-day read for me, um, and um, I, I remember I looked forward to getting back to it. I wasn't obsessed with it, but I did look forward to getting back to it. So, um, <laughs> Henry has to make his appearance. So, um, yeah, I think if you like mysteries, I think you would love this because, it, I mean, it contains its own mystery, but then it's also talking about, you know, other mystery books. So, those are my thoughts. Okay, the next one. Oh, Frederick Bachman's Us Against You. So this is the sequel to Beartown. If you watched my top 10 books from that I read in 2019, even though I was uh, hesitant to say which my favorite was, I ended up saying Beartown was my favorite read of 2019. It moved me so much and made me think so much and I loved it. So I was hesitant to read Us Against You. I didn't know when I read Beartown, had no idea this is supposed to be a trilogy. So this is the second book. The third book is not out yet. Had I known this was going to be a trilogy, I might never have read Beartown. I don't like, I don't tend to enjoy um, series. There are exceptions. Of course, I love the Harry Potter series, but um, I, I don't like to... Like, I loved Bear Town. I loved it. So what are the chances I'm going to feel that way about the second? But all in all, I did. I didn't think it was quite Bear Town. Um, so I gave this one a 4.5 stars. But I do think, I think Frederick Bachman is a, such a beautiful writer. And he really, he goes deep. He goes, he dives deep. And I am there with him listening and hanging on his every word. The only reason I kind of took off that half star and I kind of feel like a jerk to even do that. I almost, I mean, he's just so good. But there's a lot about like the local politics in this one that I could have done without. Um, but if you don't know, Bear Town, it's about a hockey town in Sweden and you do not like need to like hockey <laughs> to love these books. Um, I found a good quote online. It was from uh, the Washington Post. Uh, Beth Ann Patrick wrote this back in 2018 when uh, this um, Us Against You came out in June 2018. She she wrote, "You, if you have no interest in hockey, you might assume you'll have no interest in this novel. You would be wrong. Bachman writes about hockey the way Balzac writes about, say, the French military, meaning that his point lies far from his subject. Uh, and that's so true. Um, yes, hockey is the major component of both of these books. If you go by word count, <laughs> you'll see the word hockey in there a lot. But this book is about people and how we treat each other and how we um, how we make decisions as a group of people. In 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 this case, the town of Bear Town and. Um, this is not a light read. Uh, there's um, there's a rape in Bear Town, and uh, and of course we deal with that in Bear Town. But then we continue to deal with some of the repercussions here in Us Against You. It's just beautiful. If you love beautiful writing and a story that yeah, it's gonna hurt. It, it, you're gonna hurt while you read this because bad things happen to good people. It's beautiful. I recommend it, unless you are an extremely sensitive reader, give Bear Town and Us Against You a try. Like I said, there's supposed to be one more coming out in that series, but now I won't be as nervous. I know I'm in good hands with Frederick Bachman. I want to read all of his books. I have read A Man Called Uwe, and I loved it. I think that was a five-star book for me. Um, anyway, um, okay, the next book of the month was... Oh boy. <laughs> Talk about not really my kind of book. It's called My Lovely Wife um, by Samantha Downing. Um, this came out in March of 2019. It is a 3.9 on Goodreads. 
I gave it two stars, but I almost feel like I shouldn't even rate it. That's what I should do. I should just take away my rating completely on Goodreads because I shouldn't fault the author for writing something just, that isn't just, that just isn't my kind of thing. Um, I got it from the library. I got the audiobook and I was uh, driving. I had a six hour drive ahead of me and maybe about three hours into the book, I thought, wow, I wish I had another audiobook queued up because I would stop listening to it. Again, not because, obviously people really enjoyed this book. It's almost four stars. Um, I don't like intentional evil being like the main focus of a book. And that's how I felt this one was. But here, let me read you the book description. Okay, from the publisher. Our love story is simple. I met a gorgeous woman. We fell in love. We had kids. We moved to the suburbs. We told each other our biggest dreams and our darkest secrets. And then we got bored. We look like a normal couple. We're your neighbors, the parents of your kid's friend, the acquaintances you keep meaning to get dinner with. We all have secrets to keep a marriage alive. Ours just happens to be getting away with murder. Um... <laughs> Anyway, so I listened to the audiobook for that drive and then I downloaded the um, the ebook from the library and finished it the next day reading it. Um, so again, I read it in two days between the audiobook and the ebook. So how bad could it be? It's just that like the characters were so awful and it was such an intentional awfulness. And then the end made me so mad that ugh, it's just not my kind of book. It's just not, I should just not read it. That's, that's the bottom line. <laughs> All right, so that again, that was my lovely wife. If you enjoy thrillers and you don't mind like, you know, that, uh, that dark edginess, like being the front, front, you know, theme, then you'll probably love this book. <laughs> All right. Um, keeping on the wife theme, the next book I read, again, just not really my kind of book, but um, I read it in a couple days, My Husband's Wife by Jane Corey. Um, it's a 3.55 on Goodreads. This came out in January of 2017. Um, here, I'll read you the book description. When young lawyer Lily marries Ed, she's determined to make a fresh start and leave the secrets of the past behind. But then she takes on her first murder case and meets Joe, a convicted murderer to whom Lily is strangely, strangely drawn and for whom she will soon be willing to risk almost anything. But Lily is not the only one with secrets. Her next door neighbor, Carla, may only be nine, but she has already learned that the secrets that secrets are powerful things. And then, um, so at the beginning, Carla is only nine, but then we, we eventually, the book takes us 12 years, I think, in the future. So Carla's in her early 20s and comes back into the life of Lily and Ed and uh, takes it from there. Um, this was considered, I think, a thriller. And that kind of shocked me. I don't, I didn't, in my mind, I didn't see it that way. Um, but again, it's just really not my kind of book. Um, if you if you like a, a fairly light murder <laughs> mystery uh, contemporary fiction novel, you may like this. Like I, I didn't care about any of the characters. The characters again are not likable. There's not one you just, you just feel that connection with. Um, but it's a, it's a story. And, and apparently that's what I kept escaping to this month. Like I just was looking for stories, you know, and I think that's so true because I also started the Splendid in the Vile. I think I started it in April. Did I start it in March? <laughs> Um, anyway, this is so good. Eric Larson, he's almost, I mean, he's pretty much always excellent. And this book is so good. And yet I am still here at page 
157, I think it says. I'm just about to start part three. And I just have not been picking up this book. Instead, I've been picking up these books like The Lovely Wife and The Husband's Wife and A Perfect Murders and Never Have I Ever, you know, books that aren't really me. So I am just going to chalk this up to Strange Times. Strange Times Susan's a little off, off her game because this is so good. While I'm reading it, I'm loving it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's very interesting. I had never looked at it that way. I mean, he, this is all, you know, nonfiction, but it could read like fiction. <laughs> this is about one year um, when Churchill first took over as prime minister. Anyway, I can't review this for you yet because I haven't finished it because I keep going to books for the most part that, you know, don't mean that much to me. All right, the second to last book I read this month was... The Indigo Girl by Natasha Boyd. I read this for the book club that I'm in. We did a Zoom book club. So The Indigo Girl, Natasha Boyd. I gave this three stars. It's a 4.29 on Goodreads. Um, it's historical fiction set during uh, the year 1739 to 17. 44 in rural South Carolina, and it is the true story in a historical fiction way of Eliza Lucas. Um, we meet Eliza when she's 16 um, years old and is basically taking over her father's plantations because he is off working on his military career and her mother um, doesn't have the capacity to run the plantations. So, um, Eliza, it turns out, I mean, here, let me read this description from the publisher. Based on historical documents, including Eliza's letters, this is a historical uh, fiction account of how a teenage girl produces indigo dye, which becomes one of the largest exports out of South Carolina. Although largely overlooked by historians, the accomplishments of Eliza Lucas influenced the course of U.S. history. When she passed away in 1793, President George Washington served as a pallbearer at her funeral. And I could tell you more, but I don't want, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, she, I mean, it is an amazing story, but here's the weird thing about me. I love fiction and I love history, but often I don't enjoy historical fiction. There are so many exceptions to that, but I'm, I, oh, I read this because of the book club, and when I read the description, I was really excited. And I, I listened to it on audio, uh, free from the library, and um, I listened to it while I did that Jane Austen <laughs> puzzle that I showed to you guys in a video, like one or two videos ago. Um, so I listened to it all within two days. Um, and it's great to listen to an audio book while you're doing a puzzle. But... It was a three for me. I mean, it was good. It was okay. And if you like historical fiction, I bet you would love it because I think a lot of the ladies in the book club, I got the impression that they really enjoyed this book. And a lot of them enjoy historical fiction. So if you like historical fiction, this may be for you. Okay. So <laughs> I ended the month on a very high note and I did not read this in one sitting. I read this in many sittings, but I, jeez. I loved it. The Iliad by Homer. I did the uh, Robert Fagel's translation. I also was listening to it um, via Scribd, uh, the Caroline Alexander uh, translation. And I'm so obsessed with this. I don't, I hadn't read this since college. And I don't think I would have been obsessed with this and enjoyed it so much if I hadn't, if it hadn't been for Madeline Miller, I've got Circe over there, that had brought, that brought back, rekindled my love, and it's much more intense now than it was in college. I read it in college because I had to, although I remember enjoying it, but I'm like loving it. I am loving it. So I read Circe and then I read... Um, the Silence of the Girls, and then I read The Song of Achilles. So you gotta read the Iliad, you know? And um, this was the translation I had from college. I'm assuming the Robert Fagel's version was what we were assigned. But is this for everyone? Probably not. But this is, it's a cornerstone. If you're into classics, <laughs> 
read this because it's the, I mean, you know, this is one of the oldest stories of all time. So, so much has been influenced by Homer's books, the Iliad, the Odyssey. Um, so I, I do have the um, Emily Watson version of the Odyssey to read. I bought the Caroline Alexander version of the Iliad um, so that I can have that copy too. It should come in the next day or so. Um, I mean, you know, of course, this is the Trojan War. I, I don't know that I need to give you guys a description of the Iliad, but it's the Trojan War, which lasts, lasts 10 years. But really, this is only like a few weeks near the end of the Trojan War that we're discussing here. And it's just, it's just so dramatic and talking about you know the um the heroics and the foibles and the pettiness of both man and the gods and was, i just i loved it I, it just oh i I mean, even though I didn't read this in just a couple of sittings, like I kept going back to it, I really did savor it and um Again, not everyone's going to enjoy this. If your genre is like historical fiction, so um, one of my good friends here, we are both avid readers, but we have pretty dissimilar tastes. I'm talking to you, Mary Beth, if you're watching. Um, and she, she's not going to like this. She, she made it halfway through Circe and she's like, this just isn't for me. Whereas like Circe so far, like that is my favorite read of 2020 and this is right up there with it. Um, so this just isn't her thing, you know, and that's okay. Like she, she loved the Indigo Girl. Like that was her thing. She loves a historical fiction. Um, anyway, so she's not going to want to read this, but if you're into the classics, um, if you're into the Song of Achilles and Circe by Madeline Miller and the Silence of the Girls, like you got to read this. You just do. You have to go to the primary source. <laughs> Whatever translation you want to choose, there are lots of places online you can do um, compare and contrast the translations of the Iliad. I, I think the Richard Lattimore is really popular too. And the Caroline Alexander is like, you know, it's by a woman and it's quite recent. So, and you can't go wrong with Robert Fagels either. So that was my reading for the month of, uh, for the month of April. I had one DNF book. I don't even remember the title. Uh, then She Was Gone, which is another mystery. And it was after I had read a couple of these that I'm just like, why am I reading these? Well, I'm reading them because I'm just looking for a story for Escape, I guess. And so I just DNF'd it. It was free from the library. Um, I bought a lot of books in April. And so I have some good reading ahead of me. And like I said, I so, I so want to finish this. Um... I already, for this month, I won't go into it. This video is already getting long, but I finished the Book of Longings yesterday. Oh, this is really good. But but I have a lot to say about this. So I think this is going to be its own video. Oh, and I've been listening to Mythos by Stephen Fry on, um, I have, of course, I have the book book, but I also have it um, via um, Apple Books. I have the audio and it's read by Stephen Fry, and like I'll just listen to that as I'm cleaning or get, getting ready for bed. It's just so much fun. So if you're into if you're into all the Greek mythology, I think you would love this. But anyway, so that's still in process. This is still in process. Um, both started in April, but um, yeah. So leave me comments below. Tell me if you've read any of these and if so, what you thought. And then what are you guys reading? And what are you excited about? And I will see you again next time. Bye.